Well, thank you for uh, asking me to speak tonight. This is uh, one of many years consecutively that I've sort of spoken in this program. I'm one of the urologists in the Department of Urology, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit of, after that great talk about what the current status of screening is, some of the things we're thinking about in our department and uh, division to try and improve prostate cancer screening because clearly, uh, as Stacy pointed out, as Dr. Loeb pointed out, there are definitely areas where improvements can be made. So my title here is mostly imaging because that's what I'm going to talk about mostly, but I'm also going to try and introduce you a little bit to uh, the concepts of uh, additional biomarkers and how we might integrate those into making our screening efforts better. So currently, prostate cancer detection uh, some, some of you are probably more familiar that with this than others, uh, follows a typical trail, and that is that men come in with a PSA elevation, and that can be because their doctor checked a PSA, we call that community-based screening, or it could be because they were enrolled in a screening program. But either way, they come to us as urologists with a high PSA or an abnormal exam of their prostate. They undergo a standard biopsy, which typically includes 12 samples or randomly dispersed throughout the gland, and we try and determine what through, through that sampling effect whether they have cancer or not. Some of them will be positive, meaning they have cancer in the biopsy, and those men would go on to have uh, some decision of whether they need treatment or not based upon the biopsy information. Uh, and that risks, as pointed out in the first talk, the possibility that you would over-treat a cancer that isn't going to harm the patient, or you might under-treat a cancer uh, that could harm the patient if your biopsy data is not uh, accurate. Uh, on the other arm, if your biopsy was negative, you'd end up getting follow-up PSAs. And one of the things that plagues American men is the need for repetitive PSAs and the, the lack of assuredness in a negative biopsy that someone really doesn't have prostate cancer. And, and what we find in practice is that men often get rebiopsied, sometimes once, sometimes more than once, to try and make that determination. So that illustrates, I think, many of the limitations of the current screening paradigm. And that is the potential to detect cancers that aren't lethal, potential to miss cancers that are lethal, potential to misclassify cancers as lethal or non-lethal based on an inaccurate biopsy, and the inability to be confident of the negative biopsy result in the men who we think don't have cancer. So a lot of room for improvement, obviously. So how can we improve? Well, we can use better tests to determine the presence of the cancer, and maybe that's where imaging and some of the, the, the newer biomarkers might help us. Better tests to determine the lethality or significance. We call it significant, but really what it means is we want to find the cancers that could potentially cause death. And we need better methods to do biopsies. The random sampling effect leaves us with data that's not always accurate. So those are the things that we hope to improve through imaging and biomarker usage. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about one biomarker in particular. I, I wasn't intending to talk about experimental use of biomarkers, but there is, as Dr. Loeb pointed out, one biomarker that was approved earlier this year uh, by the FDA for use in the, in the detection of prostate cancer, and it's a urinary biomarker which measures a cancer-related RNA. Uh, it's typically done. Uh, in a sample obtained after a rectal examination. So the urologist would push on the prostate, a bit of urine would, uh, a bit of cells would be dispersed into the urine, and then the urine is collected, and uh, the, the testing is done to look for this RNA. And it's thought that this test is more specific, oops, more specific than PSA. Specificity means, in the context of detection, fewer false positives. So what we're really looking for are tests that allow us to reduce the number of unnecessary negative biopsies. This is how the, the original performance characteristics of PCA3 were shown. And you can see that PCA3 is assigned a numerical value. I don't know if this works. I guess it does not. Uh, PCA3 is assigned a numerical value. And you can see as the num numerical value of the PCA3 test increases, so too does the likelihood that someone might harbor a cancer such that if the test is over 100, it's close to 85% of men. We recently participated at NYU in a large-scale validation trial of the, of the um, 
PCA3 tests through the National Cancer Institute Early Detection Research Network. And these are some of the preliminary data which will be coming up in publication in the coming year. But basically, the very busy slide, but I can tell you what it shows is that we hope we can use the test to establish cutoffs. And in the left lower hand uh, panel, what you see is that if one employs a cutoff of 60 with this test, that the positive predictive value, meaning the likelihood of cancer in that individual, is about 80%. So we think that for people coming in for the first time, the value of this test might be in selecting those who really are at high risk for cancer. On the other hand, in patients who have had previous biopsies, as I told you, our real desire is to avoid repeat biopsy if they don't really need it. And using a lower threshold of 20 in those patients, you can see at the bottom the NPV or the negative predictive value approaches 90%. So that means if your PCA, if you've had a previous biopsy and your PCA3 is below 20, the likelihood you have cancer is only about 10%. So we think we can use these in combination, as Dr. Loeb said, with some of the other tests we're using to improve the performance characteristics and help us decide who really needs to be tested and who does not. So things that we still need to figure out with PCA3, in my opinion, one, we need to determine when to best utilize it. Do we utilize it in every man who walks in the door, or will there be subsets who would benefit from this? Clearly, screening's already expensive. To use two tests instead of one might be even more expensive. So we really need to be, be sure that all men benefit from this test. We need to understand the variability. Does it matter if one urologist pushes on your prostate harder than the other? Usually those are the guys you want to avoid. Maybe those are the guys you want to find if they're doing PCA3s. Trying to use in combination with imaging and deciding us when we need to do the biopsy. So one thing we're interested in is saying, well, if we want to use imaging and we want to use PCA3, can we use the two together to make each test more robust? We do, do have some early data from some of my colleagues which suggest that it's probably not very useful in monitoring patients with known cancer, but that's something we're still trying to figure out as well. Now, we've been using a lot of MRI at NYU. This is actually an outdated slide, but it shows you our quarterly usage of prostate MRI in our department has been on the incline, and I think if you plot this out to the present quarter, it continues to incline, and part of this is in our desire to understand how we can utilize MRI to improve our detection characteristics. Part of it is because we're starting to do MRI-guided biopsies. Part of it's because we're starting to do MRI-guided treatments for some of our patients. Uh, what is a multi-parametric MRI? Well, this is the idea that you could do an MRI in multiple sequences that test multiple functional attributes of the tissue. And I'll show you more specifically what that means. But by testing different sequences, we, it allows us to be more accurate and have fewer false positives. So T2-weighted image tells us anatomically what the prostate looks like. The diffusion-weighted image is a measure of cell density because it measures the mo random movement of water in the tissue. Contrast enhancement tells us about perfusion or blood flow. And some centers, we don't use it, but some centers use spectroscopy, which tells us about the metabolism of the tissue. So as a few examples, this is what a prostate looks like on a T2-weighted image. Uh, and uh, actually, this does. Do you see that? Yeah. So this, this thin white area around it is what we call the peripheral zone. This central area is where benign enlargement of the prostate occurs or the transition zone. This is a young prostate because there's not a lot of enlargement. Nice thick peripheral zone. This is a completely normal looking prostate, the kind of prostate one would like to have. When prostates are abnormal, they take on a more moth-eaten appearance in the periphery, and you may see specifically dark areas in the peripheral zone. This one actually looks like it's growing out of the prostate, and this would be a typical appearance of cancer on a T2-weighted image. Now, what's the limitation here? Well, a lot of things can cause darkness, just like a lot of things can raise your PSA, inflammation, bleeding, treatment changes, scarring, all these things can cause this irregular appearance, so it's not very specific. A lot of false positives if we were to use this test alone. So we enhance that by using other parameters. So this is the diffusion-weighted imaging, and again, what we look for are maps. You see here that T2 image I showed you before. Well, it also shows up as very dark on our diffusion, meaning the movement of water is very restricted. This raises our confidence that this is not a false positive, but also likely represents a cancer. 
Again, you see that bulky cancer here, very dark on the diffusion image. The added value of the ADC map really comes in men who have T2-weighted images that you can't tell anything. This looks dark all the way through. Looks like the whole prostate is cancerous, but in fact, when you do the diffusion-weighted image, you see it's really only one small dark area that's suspicious, and the rest of this is likely falsely positive, maybe inflammation or something else. So it allows us to target where we'd like to find it. And this is another example of that, a gentleman who has multiple dark areas dispersed through the prostate, but only one suspicious area here on the diffusion-weighted image. Dynamic contrast enhancement now is the way that we monitor blood flow in and blood flow out. And we can do that in several rapid sequences and put them all together in a color map. So now we have dark on the T2-weighted, dark on the diffusion, and bright red on the blood flow. This is a very suspicious area that's very likely to represent prostate cancer. Uh, the, the, the utility of the, the contrast enhancement or the blood flow is really in interpreting the other sequences because if you have isolated abnormalities, those also could be from inflammation. So each of these sequences alone might have a lot of false positives, but when you put them together, it performs quite well. This is a false positive scan where the T2-weighted, the diffusion are normal, but it looks like focal increased blood flow uh, in one area, and that's probably just inflammation. Now, when you put all those signals together, you increase the accuracy of the test. So T2-weighted alone, not great. T2-weighted plus diffusion improves substantially, and when you add the dynamic contrast, you're able to pick up 95% of cancers in this study and have an accuracy of about 86% in predicting the likelihood of an abnormality representing cancer. So really, the combination, the multiparametric approach, is what makes this robust. What can influence MRI quality as you go around? People will talk about the way they do an MRI. Well, use of an endorectal coil, putting a coil in the rectum right next to the prostate increases the near field resolution right up against the coil, but we found that the con is that there's a lot of associated patient discomfort. Having a balloon in the rectum for 45 minutes is not fun. And I think the other problem with it is perhaps the portion of the prostate that's at a distance from the coil is not as robust in the picture. So we feel with our techniques, increased magnet strength, which is in the next uh, bullet point, we can overcome the need for an endorectal coil, and we haven't used them at NYU for about five years. There's a split in the field. Half the centers think it's important, half the centers don't. Magnet strength, uh, the base is a one and a half Tesla. We use a three Tesla at NYU, and we think three Tesla gives us better resolution, and, and we're currently one of the only places in the country uh, one of very few, about a dozen places that has a seven Tesla body scanner, but it's really for, for research purposes only. Uh, the timing of the study is important, the interval to allow blood resorption. Some people say four to six weeks, some say people say three months. So if you're getting an MRI after a biopsy, you've got to wait long enough for all the blood to reabsorb for that test to be accurate. So this is an example of a 1.5 Tesla, just to review, dark on the T2 weighted images up top. This is before contrast, we see a bright signal, which is blood, so we ignore that post-contrast, but we see over here that this is bright post-contrast, so that's correlating with our abnormal area, and the diffusion-weighted images are bright on the trace image, dark on the map, so this tells us very likely to be a cancer. You can see that, so memorize that image in your mind, and now when we go here to the three Tesla stronger magnet, you get a sense that the image has a better resolution, and we can actually pick up very tiny areas of cancer in these images that we probably wouldn't pick up with good resolution on a, a weaker magnet. So we think this is the advantage of using the three Tesla. So how do we incorporate this into practice, coming back to the issue of detection? Well, one of our interests is to see if this can help us select who needs a biopsy, and this is something that needs to be tested more. One of my colleagues in France probably has the largest published series looking at this, and in his study, uh, what Dr. Villers did was to take about 500 men who came to him with an elevated PSA or an abnormal rectal exam and do a, a, a 1.5 Tesla MRI on all of them, and then ultimately do both, do a biopsy of 12 cores and do two targeted cores to the area of abnormality on the MRI. What did he find? Well, he found that of those 500 and 
55 men, 300 of them had cancer. And within those men, uh, about uh, two-thirds, uh, 351 men, had an abnormal MRI. So of the cancers detected, the MRI picked up about 85% of them. So not too bad. Now when you dissect that data a little bit more, what you see is that the standard biopsy found more cancers than the targeted biopsy would. That probably makes sense. The targeted biopsy is two cores. The standard biopsy is 12 cores. And if you look at the whole denominator, the, the targeted biopsy with the MRI only found about 80%. But when we dissect that a little further, what we find is that among the cancers here in the middle circle, 66 cancers were not found by the targeted biopsy. 53 of those were what we would deem to be insignificant or what we would consider to be non-lethal cancers, at least by the best measures of pathology that we have. So what you could conclude from that is that the ability of targeted biopsy to detect significant or lethal cancers in that set is quite good, with a specificity of approaching one, meaning no false positives, and the diagnostic accuracy of 0.98, which is quite high, and a sensitivity that's comparable to systematic. You also look at those cores and you see that you find more cancer in each individual core and higher Gleason scores on average. So the cumulative of this is that we believe that by targeting people's biopsies with the MRI, we reach one of the other attributes I talked about earlier. We make the biopsy better. We're finding the cancer, but we're getting a more accurate depiction of its Gleason score, more accurate depiction of the disease volume, and we hope that that would ultimately allow us to better select who needs treatment and who does not. And if we pay attention to the MRI, maybe avoid the need for biopsy in men who otherwise would have been potentially overtreated. This is something that needs to be proven, not, not yet proven. Now, as Dr. Loeb alluded to, there is a good correlation that you can non-invasively make some predictions about aggressiveness as well. So this is a, sli a slide that shows you that the diffusion-weighted characteristic, what we call the apparent diffusion coefficient, which is a quantitative measure of diffusion, correlates very well with the Gleason score. And so the, 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 the lower the diffusion coefficient, the uh, higher the Gleason score is on average. And you can see that correlation here. People with a um, high-grade disease tend to have more restricted diffusion of water molecules in the tissue. So we're working on ways of refining that even more so that maybe ultimately we could develop an MRI Gleason score. That's the work of one of my colleagues here, Andrew Rosencrantz, and, and working very hard to see if maybe non-invasively, without even putting a needle in it, we'd have a sense of how aggressive the cancer is. Now, reporting and targeting these things is a challenge. So when we started doing this work about four years ago, we established a reporting method that allowed us as urologists to try and figure out what exactly the radiologist was talking about and how we could find that area on MRI. I put this up only to show you it's relatively complicated. If I read this and tried in my head to figure out where the, the radiologist is talking about, not very likely I would find it. So we've looked at different ways of trying to target areas of abnormality on the MRI in, in light of trying to improve our, our, MR, our biopsies. One is to do a biopsy right in the MRI bore, and we've done a number of these here at NYU over in the Cancer Institute where we installed the system. The pro is that you can use very few needle numbers, higher yield if you're hitting the target. The con in my mind is you don't get a good sampling of the rest of the gland. It's very time consuming. Uh, for my patients who have gone through it, uh, uh, they would tell you they end up laying on their stomach for 45 minutes in the MRI scanner where we keep scanning to make sure that we're hitting the right spot. So not really, in my opinion, the best modification of MRI biopsy, of, of doing a biopsy, and not one that I think I would embrace going forward. Uh, this is an example of a case, gentleman who had had a previous atypical biopsy, and we, we, we found that his PSA was increasing. So we went back and did an MRI, found a six millimeter area, and you can see here under MRI guidance, we've inserted a needle guide into the prostate. We align that by imaging to find this area of abnormality on the imaging, hit it with target, and we found that he did indeed have cancer that we didn't identify on his first biopsy in both cores. So this is a useful technique in certain settings.
What we've been interested in is the idea of something called computerized co-registration, and we now are using this widely in our clinic. It's the idea of using a software to fuse the MRI and the ultrasound and see if this would allow us right in the urologist's office to accurately target the MRI abnormalities. This is a system we're currently using. It's an it's a image guidance and navigation system that spatially tracks the position of the probe in 3D space so that we know exactly where we are in the prostate and we can record it. And this is an example of a fusion where we take the ultrasound and the MRI, we bring them together, the radiologist marks a target, and ultimately using our uh, software, we can be sure we're putting the needle through that target as long as the patient doesn't move. Uh, and that's one of the challenges here, that prostates are part of a living being, and uh, you breathe, and you uh, turn, and you twitch slightly, and that might very slightly take the prostate out of alignment. So that's why what sounds really simple is not so simple, and it's something that we continue to try and refine. When we hit, when we hit the area we think we're hitting, we think we're going to go to biopsy, but what happens if you're not really hitting the right area? So these are things that are, are ongoing challenges for us, and this is another example of that. So I'm going to leave it at that. I think I exceeded my 20 minutes by a couple minutes. Uh, in conclusion, MRI has a role, we think, in selecting patients for repeat biopsy right now. Ultimately, we hope it has a role in selecting patients for biopsy, period. Definitely has a role in guiding the biopsy, and hopefully down the road in guiding treatments. Uh, we believe that MRI ultimately could be used to help risk stratify people, determine who does and doesn't need treatment, and this would have a major impact on, uh, in, on our ability to accurately select the right people. Uh, but clearly quality control, refinement of our tools, having good radiologists, urologists who know how to interpret the data remains a major challenge. So this is not something that I think is ready for every clinic in America, uh, but hopefully if... Uh, uh, I keep giving this yearly talk uh, for the next uh, five or ten years. Uh, we'll come to a different conclusion. Thank you.